Uh, welcome to Community-Based Climate Adaptation and Resilience. This is the eighth webinar in a series hosted by the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. Um, this series is a part of the Climate and Health Equity Fellowship, a program conducted in partnership with the National Medical Association, uh, their Southeast region, uh, and the purpose of it is to support leadership of physicians of color uh, in equitable climate change and health. This includes policy development, community education, and advocacy. I'm Dr. Mark Mitchell, the Director of State Affairs for the consortium. Also joining me from, uh, from the consortium to run the webinar are Dr. Kimberly Williams, uh, Clarissa Payton, and Bev Harp. They will be available throughout the, uh, through the chat to answer any technical questions during the webinar. This series of webinars is held for one hour on the second Friday of each month from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded and made available on our webinar on our website for future viewing. Uh, today, we are honored to have one of the most profound thought leaders, strategists, uh, policymakers, and activists uh, committed to the fight for environmental justice and, uh, and economic equity. And I do need to say that he's a, a, a friend of mine, a friend of environmental justice, a friend of health, uh, and he has been in the White House, um, not only today, uh, but previously uh, pushing to make sure that we um, are well represented um, and, um, uh, and that we, uh, and that we're heard. Uh, so Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali is internationally renowned, renowned as a keynote speaker, trainer, leader, community liaison, and facilitator, uh, specializing in social justice issues focused on revitalizing our most vulnerable communities. Um, rather than using our, our time to provide further descriptions of his impressive work, uh, we're placing the, the link to his bio in the chat. We, appreci uh, we are appreciative of his time and expertise in sharing with our community of climate and health advocates. The general format for today's webinar will be a 35 minute presentation, followed by 15 minutes of questions and answers from you, our audience. We ask that you put comments, links to any resources that you may recommend or any questions that you may have for our presenters in the chat box at any time during this presentation. Uh, please keep yourself muted so we're not interrupted by background noise. Um, and uh, Mustafa, you may begin. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Mitchell. I appreciate it. Y'all might not know Dr. Mitchell has known me since I was pretty much a student. So he's seen uh, the evolution in my growth from a knucklehead kid to somebody who is really trying to do what I can along with others to make a change happen. It's good to be with family, and I see some folks uh, in the boxes uh, that I've known for quite a while and a number of new faces as well. So I just want to start off by saying thank you all for what you're doing, uh, for your commitment to our most vulnerable communities, to, to making sure um, that we're uplifting them, and making sure that their voices are heard and utilizing the blessings that God has passed on to you, those skills and abilities uh, to be a part of the whole. Um, and making change happen. I, I have a real pretty PowerPoint that I was going to share with y'all, but I'm actually scared to hit the button because I might end up crashing everything. So I, I'm just going to walk y'all through a few things. Uh, hopefully I will be able to create a, a, a vivid illustration of the things that are going on across the country. I, I want to talk about policy. Um, I, I want to talk about uh, communities. Uh, I want to talk about collaboration. Uh, and I want to also talk about this transformational moment that we find ourselves in, um, both on the challenge side, uh, but also on the opportunity side, which is literally huge if we get it right. You know, often when we have a conversation about policy, people want to kind of clean policy up and they don't want to actually talk about how it's been utilized in our country to one, do some good things, but also to do some very devastating things as well. So I believe in going back to the beginning. Um, because if you don't get to the root, sometimes you don't know how to actually fix some of the things that are going on. So when I talk about policy, 
I'm, I'm talking about how our country, labeled as one of the greatest countries on the planet, depending on how you want to analyze that, how there was justification for removing indigenous brothers and sisters from their land, the land that we currently reside on. I'm currently on the Pamunkey and the Mattapanai land. And out of that policy, we actually said that it was okay to remove people, to take folks away from their traditional foods. And for those of you who are in the, the medical background, you understand how important it is to have a healthy diet, but a diet that also resonates with where you come from and not utilizing other types of foods. We also know that policy literally, literally justified the genocide of indigenous brothers and sisters. Well, Mustafa, what do you mean about that? Folks knew that when they were giving indigenous brothers and sisters those blankets that had smallpox on it, that's germ warfare, if we want to just actually call it out like it is. And we also now understand how deadly pandemics uh, and those vectors can be when we're dealing with the COVID-19 or for those of us who also worked on West Nile or a number of the other diseases that we now seeing taking root inside of our country, which were normally tropical diseases and a number of other things that were going on. It was policy that said that you can go to Africa and you can bring folks to this country and enslave them and give them the most dangerous jobs to do, to once again, take them away from their traditional foods and their traditional languages and their culture, and, and then create all these dynamics that we all know that were a part of chattel slavery. We know that it was policy that said that We'll bring Chinese men to our country to build the infrastructure, especially the railroads, and then we will institute the Chinese Exclusion Act. It was policy that said that Japanese brothers and sisters could be interned in camps, even though we allow brothers and sisters from Germany, brothers and sisters from another of other European countries to not have to face that same type of a situation, even though we were at war with them at the same time. So I want us to understand it was policy that said that women didn't have the right to vote, that women shouldn't own land, and that women should be seen and not heard. It was policy that justified those types of behaviors. But we also understand that when we get engaged in the process, that we can flip policy. The women's suffrage movement built policy that began that long journey of women getting equity and equality. And we know we still got a long way to go, especially when women are not paid the same as men. We know that when we got engaged around uh, addressing Jim Crowism and the civil rights movement, it was a push toward policy to make sure that the rights of African-Americans would one day be fully upheld. That is policy. It is policy also in the early environmental movement, even though it was broken and didn't represent the voices and experiences of black and brown and indigenous communities. It was still that policy that began to say we can get in place the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, RICRA, Superfund, all these different types of things that help us to be better protected. But we understand that, that social safety net still has holes in it. And that's why even to today, and I will talk about the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And I will talk also about the reconciliation bill or, or the jobs bill or however you wanna label it, that we still got these gaps that exist in our social safety net. It was policy, hang on brothers and sisters, in the medical context that put in place segregation, where if you are an a African-American person or a Latinx person or an indigenous person, and you had an emergency, you might have to go clear across to the other side of town to actually be able to get treatment. And we also know that we still have biases that exist, both in the public health side and the medical side of the equation and the way that we treat um, you know, folks of color. So when we know these things, my grandmother says that when you know better, do better. This is the opportunity that we have. So some folks will often say, well, you know, why do we focus so much on environmental racism, on environmental injustice? And many organizations are now beginning to, to, to evolve into their priority setting, into their criteria about better understanding that. And let me just call out for all those folks who are doctors or who are working in the public health realm, we've got to make sure that the educational aspect is focusing on environmental medicine as well.
because it's critically important in this moment when we have so many folks who are dealing with toxic exposures, when we have so many folks who are Ooh. going to be dealing with the climate crisis and how it is going to exacerbate and how it will exacerbate plenty of the uh, pre-existing medical conditions that I'm gonna talk about today as we continue um, on this journey. Now, for most folks, they don't really completely understand how deadly air pollution actually is. Sometimes because folks, unless they see something coming out of the stacks, they really don't know what's going on. Folks are moving through their life they're trying to keep the lights on. They're trying to put food on the table. They're trying to save a couple of dollars so they can put their kids uh, to college, just like Joel Charles will one day with that beautiful baby that we see right there. We've got between 100 and 200,000 people who are dying prematurely from air pollution every year. So when we begin to have these conversations about how do we create resilient communities, we got to get to the root first of what's going on before we have the fuller conversation about climate change. We've got more people dying from air pollution than are dying from car crashes. Everyone knows somebody who's probably been in a bad car accident or somebody who unfortunately has lost their life. More people are dying from air pollution than are dying from gun violence. And so many of us have focused on addressing the issues that are going on in that space. More people are dying from air pollution than are dying from overdoses from drugs. Think about that for a second. If we have that many people who are losing their lives to air pollution, why don't we have better training about what's happening in that space? Why don't we have stronger pieces of legislation and policies to be able to eliminate that threat? We got 24 million people in our country who have asthma. I can see some folks right now, if you know somebody who has asthma, what I want you to do is just real quickly hit the chat and you can just say yes, or you can say, I've got somebody in my family who has asthma, whatever the situation might be. Or if you don't want to do that, just raise your right hand if you know somebody who has asthma. We got 7 million kids in our country right now who are suffering from asthma. And disproportionately, it is African-American Latinx communities who are the ones who are going to the emergency room. Some of you will see them. They are the ones who are losing their lives prematurely. Sometimes they're losing their lives prematurely because families can't afford the medicine, because they're trying to make a decision between paying some other bills. So folks kind of try and ration some stuff out and then something actually hits you. We got to have the fullness of these conversations so folks understand the dynamics that are going on. Because we've got communities like the 48217 in Detroit. When kids look out the window, instead of seeing trees and green space, something that many uh, of you and myself may have been blessed to be able to see, they're seeing the refineries and they're seeing the stacks. And so they're getting these exposures and they're not doing anything wrong except just trying to live. Because we know the restrictive covenances and the redlining and the zoning has pushed, pushed African-Americans into certain communities, pushed Latinx brothers and sisters into certain communities, pushed Asian and Pacific Islanders into certain communities, pushed indigenous brothers and sisters, yes, on reservations, but also in certain cities being pushed into certain areas and even lower wealth white communities. These dynamics that have gone on have created these sacrifice zones where people disinvest in these communities. And then they ask, say, well, it must be genetics or it must be your diet. But they never include into that overall formula and analysis the toxins that you are breathing in day in and day out, thousands of times a day. That has to be a part of when we're talking about creating resilient communities, then we got to get to the root causes of what's going on. Places like Cancer Alley, many of you have heard about, running between Baton Rouge and Louisiana, some of the highest cancer rates in the country. This is a community that was founded by freed enslaved people. And then, for as far as the eye can see, petrochemical facilities and other greenhouse gas emitting facilities and polluting facilities, these communities are surrounded. And then folks will say, well, why don't you just move? How do I move if you stripped all the value out of my home? Where am I supposed to go? When I'm living in a medically underserved area or a physician desert because you won't make the investments to make sure that doctors can be in that area and so that they can make a, a, decent, uh, you know, a decent salary at the same time because they're committed 
but you got to be able to support that commitment. You know, you, you got places like in Appalachia, in the Kanawha Valley, that when you go there, you got these cancer clusters. You got a lot of lower wealth and working class white folks and black folks who are there and the emissions get trapped in the summertime because they don't move, move through because the winds aren't there. And then people are getting all the exposures, they're getting cancer, they're getting liver and kidney diseases, they're getting these breathing difficulties. And all of you know, in this moment, if you have a lung disease, you know how it makes you more vulnerable to COVID-19, to both infections, hospitalizations, and the loss of life. We've got to make sure that people are paying attention to what's happening in this state. We also know that we've got all of these different types of water quality issues that are going on and this pollution that is a part of this, that the only way we can have resilient communities is to address this. Let me back up just quickly before I start to talk about water. You know, it, it's interesting that we will have this conversation, important conversation about the climate crisis without talking about where the drivers are coming from. A set of those drivers is because people did not want to pay attention to black and brown folks who said, please, please look over here. My community is literally dying from these sets of exposures. And some people said, I'm here with you, but not enough. And now we realize that one of the drivers in the climate crisis is because we allowed all those facilities to be placed in these communities and that pollution that's coming out of the stacks that was making black and brown people sick and shortening their lives is that same pollution that is playing a significant role in warming up our oceans and our planet and causing these climate crises to continue to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And I'll talk about that. On the water side of the equation in our country, we've got 60 million people over the last decade who've drank unsafe drinking water. In the United States of America, how does that even make any sense? We talk about Flint, Michigan. We talk about the impacts that happened there from lead pollution and how those babies that many of us held in our arms. I had a small child look at me and say, Mustafa. Well, she actually said, Mufafa. She said, am I going to be all right? What do you tell a child who's been poisoned by lead when you know what the prognosis is? And you know that if the additional resources <laughs> and education are not brought into uh, the overall sets of actions that that child is gonna be left behind. And when that child gets left behind, human nature takes over. And human nature wants to be able to do something to be able to support your family. So sometimes when you've done lower uh, folks IQ points, when you've taken away educational opportunities, survival kicks in and people will do what they have to do to survive. So if we make the investments on the early end, then you don't have to make all these investments in the prison industrial system. Let's just have real talk real quick. We know that right now in Benton Harbor, Michigan, Benton Harbor, Michigan has higher levels of lead in their water than Flint did. And we know what a catastrophe Flint was. We've got 3000 locations across the country that have higher levels of lead in their water than Flint did. And now we've got a glaring alarm that is going off. And yet we still got folks on Capitol Hill who I deal with who still want to play when it comes to replacing these lead service lines because they don't have to worry about it in their communities. But all of our folks do have to worry about what's going on. And then medical practitioners on the public health and the medical side then have to deal with the outcomes of our lack of investments in this space. If we want to create resilient communities, then we have to build the infrastructure inside of the infrastructure inside of our most vulnerable communities. Because we can't have places like Lowndes County, Alabama, where folks are literally walking in human waste because we refuse to build the right types of treatment and hooking people up to sewer systems. So now they're dealing with tropical diseases right there throughout the Black Belt. And that means that doctors have got to, you know, get better versed on things that they might not normally have to deal with. But this is what's coming because the climate crisis is going to increase temperatures. It's going to increase these rain events and flood events and all these other types of things that once that initial natural disaster is over, the water's still there. The mosquitoes and other vectors, you know, they're multiplying and they're bringing new sets of diseases in to communities who are least able, least resilient 
to be able to fight against this. So we've got to make sure the infrastructure is in place as we're trying to strengthen these policies to be better protective. We see these dynamics that are going on with PFOS. We've got these algae blooms that are, are popping up. We've got these certified animal feeding operations where they're creating these giant lagoons and all these diseases that are coming from there and the exposures that people are dealing with. These are sets of things that are tied to policy. They're tied to public health and our medical system being able to deal with it. And it's also tied to resources and where we are or are not going to actually invest to make real change happen. You know, we, we've got so many different types of situations that are happening across the country. We still have indigenous brothers and sisters who are dealing with uranium tillings and a number of other things that are going on. And as we move toward this new climate economy that I'll talk about, I just wanna call out the fact that there is mining that still will happen in that space. When you pick up your cell phone, there are mineral, or there are precious metals that are a part of that. There are gonna be precious metals that are a part of electric vehicles and the charging stations and the batteries and all these other things that are critically important moving forward, but we have to have the policy and the intentionality to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes that the fossil fuel economy had. Because the fossil fuel economy, and I'm not gonna take anything away from folks before they knew better, but as people began to know better, they should have done better. It was like the cigarette industry that continued for decade after decade after decade, trying to create revisionist history, trying to create different narratives, knowing that they were literally killing people. Now the fossil fuel industry in the beginning didn't, but as time went on, Exxon and others knew about some of the impacts that were going on. And as the science got stronger, we knew that we had to break our addiction to fossil fuels because if we don't, our medical costs continue to expand and exponentially grow. We know that you lose value around those types of facilities and a number of other dynamics that go on in that space. I know I only have a little bit of time, um, but, uh, but I really wanna unpack some of this stuff for you because each and every one of you are gonna have to think critically moving forward uh, about how you want to invest in this space. So we find ourselves in this moment, in a moment where we see hurricanes, category five hurricanes now becoming with a, a, a lot of regularity. We find floods happening both in rural and urban settings. It blew people's mind when we had the expressway in Philadelphia underwater and people's cars floating by. And in Jersey and in New York, when the subway system began to fill up and people were trying to run out to get to higher ground. And in places like Miami and in places uh, along the Virginia coast, where when the tides just begin to shift because the oceans are rising, people are being pushed further and further inland. We find, and down in, in Louisiana, where our indigenous brothers and sisters who lived on some of the islands that were there can no longer live there, can no longer enjoy their cultural practices there. Let me call out our Gullah Geechee brothers and sisters off of the Georgia and South Carolina uh, coast, who now are finding it even more difficult to be able to hold on to those African uh, principles and cultural aspects that help them to be able to navigate over hundreds of years because of both the storms and the surges that are going on. All of this is tied to the sets of choices that we made and continuing to utilize these fossil fuels and on our transportation routes, which there have been biases and discrimination built into it. Everybody knows you guys are educated in our country that highways were used to separate communities, to drop off wealth in certain communities and to lead pollution into other communities. In our housing policy, placing lower wealth housing in floodplains 
and, and next to these facilities that we've been talking about, and then causing these exposures based upon where you are. All of this has been a part of the dynamics that are going on. So in this moment, now we get a chance to begin to address the sins of the past, as my auntie would say. We get a chance to finally begin to start moving in a direction that actually represents people. We've got this bipartisan infrastructure bill and we've got this reconciliation bill. And that bipartisan bill, a lot of the stuff is things that you're used to seeing, roads and bridges, some money in there for wastewater treatment, uh, a little bit of money that's in there to get some of the lead pipes out and, and a number of the other sort of hard infrastructure stuff. But remember earlier, I talked about this social safety net that's so incredibly important. And that's why this reconciliation bill, that $3.5 trillion that they continue to talk about, and now people are trying to shrink down that we can't allow that to happen. And it's because of a number of things. We need to make sure that we're honoring our elders and the wisdom that they bring to us. There are dollars in there for elder care and to make sure that folks who have been around for a while, that we are supporting them. There are dollars in there for youth, making sure that the nutrition for those of us who work on food justice issues, we understand how critically important it is to make sure that people have healthy and clean and affordable and accessible food. So there's dollars that's in there around nutrition and education. There's additional dollars in there for broadband. For those of you, um, you know, in the medical field, you understand that we're starting to utilize telemedicine um, in, a, in a larger way. But we also understand that we still have that digital divide that exists in certain communities. So if you don't have that high speed internet, it makes it real difficult sometimes to be able to connect and to be able to make sure that you're having those engagements that are so critically necessary. And also on the environmental side of the equation, you know, many of the federal government agencies are now moving toward getting your public comment through the utilization of the internet and being able to hear and participate. So we got to make sure that everybody actually has that. And yes, we got to move forward on this new clean economy, making sure that we have this grid that's in place, making sure something that I care a lot about that we got those dollars for energy efficiency to be in place. Because we know that for black and brown communities and indigenous communities, that we utilize a disproportionate share um, of our disposable dollars on utility costs. So if we are helping people to one, build new homes and build them correctly, but two, for existing homes and for folks who rent to make sure that that's in place is critically important because we've got to address the wealth gap as we move forward also. So we've got a number of different things that are inside of this reconciliation bill that can really help us. I call out almost every place that I go that we've had hospitals and clinics over the last four years that were shutting down um, at an alarming rate, especially in rural communities uh, and sometimes in urban communities. So we gotta make sure that the dollars are also there to get the clinics in place, to make sure that all of the opportunities that folks should be able to have to access medical services are being supported. And we can do that by making sure that we're also greeting those facilities so that we can keep the cost down uh, for the folks who own those. We have to have a holistic set of actions and strategies to prepare for this 21st century. If you understand the game of what's been going on, people have made the minimal investments and they operated from a 20th century mentality. If you look at our funding vehicles, I worked on Capitol Hill for two years for John Conyers. He taught me a huge amount when I was with him about how people will often move resources from the things that will actually matter to these pet projects and some of these other dynamics that go on because of donors and all this other kind of stuff. We have to change that dynamic and we have the ability to do that. Now, sometimes people say, well, Mustafa, ain't nothing gonna change. Same old, same old. The people in power are always gonna be the people in power. I don't believe that because I've seen, I've seen over the last few years that there is a cultural shift that's happening in our country that people don't often talk enough about. You know, I remember when we had the science march and people said the scientists would never come out their labs and scientists, even though they didn't have no rhythm, they came on out and they marched 
And then they began to say, you know what? We can be doing better. We can actually be utilizing our gifts and abilities to better support vulnerable communities with the information they need, with the translation of that information, with a number of other things. And Dr. Mitchell, I'm gonna finish up here real quick. And then we also have seen through the Black Lives Matter movement, you saw African-American brothers and sisters, white brothers and sisters, Latinx brothers and sisters, Asian and Pacific Islander brothers and sisters, indigenous brothers and sisters, LGBTQIA folks all coming together to say that the 21st century has to look different and that we are willing to lean in, that we are willing to invest our time, our resources and our bodies to make sure that that happens. And you're seeing that in a number of movements where people are beginning to come together. I know when you turn on the news, you, you see the crazy stuff that goes on. You, you see people rushing up on, on the Capitol Hill and into that. But there is a larger body of people who are saying that this country is going to be different and we are going to do something about it. And those of us, uh, you know, work in the public health field and in the medical field have to be a part of that if we are going to create resilient communities. So I'm going to slow down now because I know you have a lot of questions where we can dive deeper into this framework that I've built. But I'll leave you with a couple of quotes that I follow. One of them is from James Baldwin. And this is for each and every one of you. James Baldwin said that if I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things that you don't see. Each and every one of you are going to have a, a, a level and a viewpoint that maybe others won't have. And you have a responsibility to be able to get engaged, to help people, to be able to see some of the things that are going on. And the last thing I'll share with you is from my mother and my grandmother. And my, they taught me this as a young boy, that you have power unless you give it away. Let's use our power to actually make real change happen. Let's use our privilege. Everyone who has an education has been blessed with privilege. Let's use that to actually make change in a positive direction happen. Let's lift up our frontline organizations and communities. And let's make sure that our tomorrow is brighter than our today's. I wanna thank you all for giving me a couple of seconds of your time. I look forward to unpacking um, many of the things that you may have questions about. So thanks so much, uh, Mustafa, for uh, such a great presentation. It's uh, clear why you're a leader in the environmental justice uh, movement. Um, but uh, now we'll go ahead and take questions from the audience. And I remind our um, viewers that that you can type in your questions in the chat box and then we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, we ask that you also please take a moment to fill out the webinar survey. Um, a link to the survey is now being put into the chat. Uh, but I will go ahead and start out the uh, questions. Uh, you talked about how a, a number of communities are being affected by uh, climate change and how it's different in different communities. You know, the, the subways uh, flooding in New York, the, um, you know, in Miami, the sea level rise, um, and even in places like New Orleans. Um, you know, obviously New Orleans was hit by uh, Katrina um, uh, 15 years ago, and then they were hit again by um, Ida, I think, uh, recently. Um, so the, my question is about, you know, resiliency and, and the role of community um, in adaptation. Um, you know, did, um, uh, did they learn anything in New Orleans? What was different uh, this time than uh, from before? Uh, did they, um, you know, did they, did the community have anything to do uh, with the changes that were made or were they excluded again this time? So the communities definitely play a stronger role over the years. Um, it wasn't always easy, uh, Mark, as you know. Folks had to continue to knock and push on the door uh, to, be able to, to be able to get into that space. Well, some of the things that changed in New Orleans, but let's put it in the broader context all the way up to Baton Rouge. So in New Orleans, they got those pumping stations in and they raised many of the levees, um, which helped to protect 
you know, parts of New Orleans that if that, that wouldn't have been in place, then we would probably have seen something very similar that we saw in Katrina. Um, there's still flooding that happens, you know, with, with many of the rain events that are there, but the, the water begins to move. Now, here's the thing that we, we got to broaden it out because when you get outside of New Orleans proper, there was flooding that was happening in these other areas that weren't blessed with the resources to be able to get some of these advanced techniques and being able to move water in place. And we still have, and I apologize to folks, how did we get to some of these, these, these major surges that go on? When you go down to Louisiana and parts of Texas, what you'll find is that because of the oil industry and because of these canals that they built uh, and because they moved a lot of the, the wetlands and the marsh grasses and all these other types of things that used to slow some of this stuff down, they've continued to play a big role. So if they're still there, still doing, not evolving, um, then we're gonna continue to have some of these problems. But when you start getting outside uh, of New Orleans, they, there were still real challenges that were there. Um, so we've gotta to continue to move that education and resources um, across the Gulf Coast. Uh, to make sure as many people as we can are protected. Here's the reality of the situation. We, th we were hoping that we'd be able to get to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, all of you have seen the IPCC report and the National Climate Assessment Report and some of the things they've told us. It now looks like the best we're gonna be able to do is two degrees Celsius. And that means that there are gonna be these additional impacts. If we get past two degrees Celsius, It'll be very difficult for most people to be able to live along the coast, whether we're talking about the Atlantic coast or the Gulf coast. Um, so we just gotta be mindful of that when we're talking about resilient communities because if we can't keep the emissions down, then we have to have some serious hard conversations uh, about being able to relo relocate people. And when we're talking about relocating communities, we're talking about breaking up uh, these cultural compacts that we have with each other where we've got auntie who watches babies sometimes while folks can go to work. And we've got these other dynamics that are part of, of our community. So we've gotta be then talking about how do we keep communities whole in that movement? And as I mentioned earlier, when we were talking about the indigenous brothers and sisters, you know, who were removed from their island um, and now are moving further and further inland, we see the, the dynamics, the mental health dynamics, the trauma dynamics, um, that come in that we often don't talk enough about the trauma, uh, the stressors that are a part of many of the things that I talked about um, with a number of communities. Thank you so much. Um, I think now we'll go ahead and turn to questions from the audience. Uh, Clarissa, can you uh, tell me what questions we might have? Um, yes, I do see a couple of questions. It looks like one of the first questions um, it asks, um, what is the difference between vulnerability and drivers of environment? Um, let me see here. Um, vulnerability and drivers of environmental injustice that you spoke about. Well, the drivers are systemic racism. The drivers is disinvestments. Those are the real drivers. If you, if you really want to break it down, we can, we can pretty it up. Um, and, and, and use, you know, some big letter words. But when, when you unpack this stuff, the, those, are, those are some of the, the main discrimination biases, um, which have said that certain people are not worthy as other people. Um, and, and we just have to, you know, the, that's an old way of thinking. We have to, we have to get rid of it. it. Comes out of tribalism. And, and you see folks on Capitol Hill trying to push people back into, in, into tribalism because they operate, even though they understand what's really going on. They want folks to think that there's only this much resources. And, and that means that folks have to fight over them. And then people have, will say, well, we have to make some tough decisions, Mustafa, or John, or Betty, uh, about where we're going to invest. I operate from a paradigm of abundance, that when we do things right, things grow. Um, also, I handled appropriations on Capitol Hill, so I understand where dollars are. And I know how many dollars are actually out there. Um, so to answer your question, it goes back to systemic racism, biases, discrimination, um, and, and some of the other things that I mentioned. And that creates these vulnerabilities. 
And, and, you know, and that's why we have to have paradigms that help us to understand the vulnerabilities um, and, and, and the various aspects that are necessary to begin to uh, change that dynamic. Because we, most folks, have been putting band-aids on situations, right? Because we don't get a chance to fully heal or cure, you know, what the overall root causes are. And now we're moving into a space where we're trying to actually do that. The environmental justice movement has been trying to do that for decades to say, it is not just about this one permit. The permit is, is important, but we're trying to get to the deeper things as well, which will stop you from doing these types of things that are making us vulnerable. Um, so we should understand that. Uh, and and it, it is a part of you know, other movements as well. The beauty of the environmental justice movement, if you give me 15 seconds, is that it is about the environment, but it is also about public health. It is also about housing and transportation and jobs. It is about voting. Um, and it's about food justice. It is about all these different types of things that determine if we are going to have healthy and resilient communities, um, or if we put people in a survival mode. People hear me talk about moving from surviving to thriving. My focus is on the thriving aspect, but we have to address the survival things that are going on, be able to get people to be able to move to that position. So I hope that helps a little bit. I can always write some things down if that's more helpful. Right. So, yeah, so I thought that that was, uh, that that was just right. I mean, I think that, you know, the question is what can communities do? And I hear you saying that uh, they can uh, support uh, community-based action, uh, environmental justice action, you know, and we as health, uh, health professionals can support those groups uh, mm -hmm. that are on the front line um, uh, in, in order to do that. So let's, let's move on to another question, uh, Clarissa. Yes, yeah, so um, I do see one question in regards to the possibility of getting solar to low-income families. And I've also seen a couple of questions talking about um, electric vehicles and how that could be um, better, how we can better allow that to be accessed to people of lower incomes. So both of those are critically important, but there has to be intentionality and we've got to get it right. So. And, you know, you heard me talk about, you know, the, whether it's 100,000, 200,000 people are dying prematurely from air pollution. Solar can play a, a role in helping to um, lower many of those impacts that are going on. But with solar, we also got to understand that for folks who are on a fixed income, uh, for folks, you know, who don't have a whole lot of disposable wealth, we've got to make solar more affordable. Um, and there are some initiatives right now that are trying to uh, make sure that that initial cost, um, that, that that's being met. Inside the reconciliation bill, there's actually some dollars for that. Let me talk about EVs real quickly also, because it kind of ties into that. One of the major drivers in, in the climate crisis is our transportation. Um, whether we're talking about cars, trucks, buses, trains, planes, um, or what's going on on the ports. So, as we begin to electrify both the ports and begin to electrify our transportation systems, it also helps us to deal with those folks who are dying prematurely from air pollution. Now, we've got to make sure that there is this thing, this dynamic that's happening in relationship to electric vehicles where we are front loading the incentives so that folks can actually afford them. Most folks ain't got 70 or $80,000 to drop for a Tesla. Some folks don't got 45,000 for the, for the little baby Tesla. You know, even though Tesla got his own set of issues, there are, and there are other companies that are moving into, into the EV space. But again, we got to make sure that it's affordable for folks. And then we got to grow up the used car market so that folks, because most folks end up buying used cars anyway. So we got to make sure that's there. Let's go a little bit deeper real quickly. The other part is the batteries. Um, now batteries for EVs will last a considerable amount of time, but there are also uh, precious minerals that are a part of the design of the EV batteries. So we got to make sure that when folks are digging up those precious uh, minerals that are, are metals that, um, you know, we're not doing additional harm to folks as well in there. EV charging stations, and folks have heard me talk about this. So EV charging stations, one, we got to make sure they're in our communities. That's great. But two, 
We got to make sure that black and brown folks actually own the businesses that are creating it. So in everything that I talk about in the climate economy, I want to know how are you going to ensure that folks who have traditionally been banned or banned or blocked from being able to participate in those markets, that that's going to happen because it helps us to deal with the generational wealth. It also, we know when people make more money that they have better health care and they take better care of themselves because they have the time to do it. Um, so all of these things, we have to think in a very holistic fashion because we can't just say clean economy, good and stop there. We got to go deeper onto that. Um, and then, you know, we'll see how it all plays out. Excellent. Very good. Uh, Clarissa, do you have another question? Yes. Um, so one question is basically kind of um, asking about how, um, as physicians, should they use their existing knowledge um, while also honoring and respecting the expertise of the communities that they're trying to work with? Mm -hmm. What's the best way of kind of cultivating and developing those relationships? Showing up. Showing up. Spending time. Listening. Folks, everybody's busy. But the beauty of the COVID-19 moment is that everybody started utilizing Zoom and Blue Jeans and, and all these other platforms. So you can spend time with folks. Folks have meetings that are on. You can Zoom in. You know, of course, you're gonna have conversations before, let folks know you wanna listen and learn, uh, hear about what priorities that they are working on, to hear about the questions that they have. And then you bring your expertise into the mix in an authentic collaborative partnership. Let me say it again, authentic collaborative partnerships. That means that you're not just doing a drive-by, that you're not just parachuting in, but that you're spending consistent time with folks. Now that doesn't mean that every day that, that you're talking with folks, maybe you will, but that does mean that folks know that, you know, you're not just you're gonna be a one-timer. Um, you know, there, there, there's opportunities for the one-time stuff if that's all that folks need, but people are really need to be able to build trust because there've been so many broken promises inside of communities that you gotta make sure that you're not contributing um, to that unfortunate uh, set of actions of the past. The other part is that you're gonna have a better understanding of understanding some um, of the chemicals and other things that people, or, or some of these pre-existing medical conditions that folks are dealing with, they need somebody who they trust and you could be one of those folks. Yeah, I thought that that was a very good answer, yeah. Uh, yeah, communities, have a lot of knowledge. And I think that people need to be open to learning from communities uh, and, um, and ask them you know, what they need. And oftentimes they can tell you um, what they need and what kind of solutions that they can, they can get to. Um, why don't we take one more question, uh, Clarissa? Hey, I see one. Um, it says, how do you see the other side of the equation, namely carbon sequestration? impacting environmental injustice? Well, that's- Don't that's, curse. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that, that's a tough one. It's, it's tough, but it's not tough. So for many folks in the environmental justice movement, whether we're talking about uh, carbon trading programs or carbon sequestration or a number of these other uh, sets of technologies, um, it presents some challenges. It presents challenges because in many of these scenarios, you end up creating hot spots. You also move dollars from other uh, activities that folks know work um, to things that we um, are hoping will work or some folks are hoping will work. So it, it creates a really interesting dynamic. I believe in real talk, Mark's known me for a long time. Dr. Mitchell has known me for a long time. Um, you have folks on Capitol Hill and folks at the White House right now who see lots of value in carbon sequestration. They feel that it is an important component in being able to meet uh, the goals that the IPCC has placed in front of them. Um, and, and because many folks feel more comfortable with uh, man-made technologies and natural technologies and also just completely beginning to cut the cord uh, on fossil fuels. So you're gonna have to, understand that these dynamics are going on um, and that, you know, that there are going to be these divergent viewpoints. You know, folks from the environmental justice movement are always thinking about people's health um, and, and how we make sure that we are uh, protecting that. Um, I'll leave you with this. 
because you know I'm kind of a sciencey wall a wonk. When you talk about carbon sequestration beyond the talking points and ask people for examples of uh, of where it is working, it gets very thin very fast. So when we put out the theoretical models, that that's what they usually lean on. So I think most folks, if you um, you know can show them that things are, are working and that their communities are not going to um, continue to be impacted, then they're, then they're open to a conversation. Um, but until you can do that, then I think that that's gonna be a very tough selling point. So thanks so much, uh, Mustafa. We really appreciate your um, uh, coming. I'm no, I, I know that the discussion can go on for a lot longer, but you know, but we need to wrap things up. And I also want to thank all of you um, uh, listeners for participating in this month's webinar, and I hope that you found it useful. Next month's webinar is scheduled for November 12th, and our topic will be uh, climate solutions in healthcare and public health systems. And so I encourage you to register to attend if you're able. We'll send out a follow-up email with a list of recommended readings and resources on the topic of environmental justice. Uh, before you leave though, I wanna remind you again to complete the webinar survey if you haven't done so already. Um, again, the link is in the chat. Uh, and we'd like to thank our uh, sponsor, Johnson & Johnson, and our co-sponsors, the Energy Foundation and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for their generous support of the Climate and Health Equity Fellowship Program and of this webinar series. So this now concludes our session. So have a good day. Thank you.